<clears throat> I have the best job in the world. I, uh, I'm a curator of fishes at one of the world's greatest natural history museums. In this particular case, ev every, every day I get to spend a night at the museum, which is a very wonderful thing. I also get the opportunity to travel all over the world uh, doing my research, which is a, is a, a gift. I, I have to say, um, we're talking about history for my personal history. The lesson I want to, to bring is don't listen to people when they say, oh, don't do that, you'll never get a job. When I was uh, being educated, I, I, I don't know why, but I fell in love with fish. <laughs> and I, I, you know, everyone says I should have moved on to chips long ago. It's been so long I've been, <laughs> been studying fish. Um, but I stuck with it. But everybody said to me, and this was at a time when I was beginning to think about, well, well what am I going to do? I want to get higher education. I, want, I need to do a PhD. Um, I'll, I'll do it in ichthyology. And everyone said to me, Melanie, you're crazy. You will never get a job. And I was like, well, maybe I won't, but I'll have an extremely wonderful time in those years when I get my PhD. So I did it. And I would recommend that to, to everyone. In my case, I was incredibly lucky, and I ended up getting the best job in the world. Um, I had to work for it. I mean, I, I've spent time unemployed. I've spent time cleaning houses. I've done all sorts of stuff. So I've, I've paid my debts. But the, the take home message, the, the personal history message is please stick to your passion. Do what you love because it's going to pay off in the end. Even if it's not going to pay off with an actual job, it's going to pay off with, with, with your soul, with satisfaction. And for me, of course, that passion is fish. Don't ask me why. Well, actually, you can ask me why, because I could give a whole lecture on why fish are amazing. Um, <laughs> but they actually tell us a lot about evolution, how life has evolved on this planet. And that's the kind of history I'm bringing to this group here. It's the deep history, the history of our planet. And I'm kind of trying to get at that by looking at fish. And I hope I'll explain a little bit about why looking at fish can ultimately uh, tell you a lot about the history of the planet. Um, and I'm going to focus on, on one particular fish. It's just one little fish um, that, I, that I discovered in my researches in Africa. And that little fish opened up a whole new world to me. So it was just one thing that you come across and you think, hmm, that's very interesting. What's going on there? And if you stick with that and you keep ans asking those questions, what's going on here? Um, sometimes it really pays off. And, and this example I'm going to tell you about, I think, is, is one of those big payoffs. So I do a lot of my work, most, most of my um, ichthyological work uh, takes place in Africa. And I work on freshwater fishes, not marine, freshwater fishes. So I study the freshwater fishes of Africa. And I concentrate on the fishes of the Congo Basin. Now, the Congo River is the freshwater heart of Africa. It's an immense basin. It's over 4,500 kilometers long. It drains the whole of Central Africa, 4 million square uh, kilometers of, of land in Central Africa is drained by the Congo River. It's, an, um, it's a massive, hugely important structure in Africa. It's also tremendously important to the people of Central Africa. Over 50 million people live in this area. And over 50 million people, nearly all of them, depend in very profound ways on the Congo River. They depend on it from, for food, primarily fish, but they also depend on it for transportation. The, cent the, the Congo Basin is the size of Europe. It's massive. There are 300 kilometers of paved road in that country. 300 kilometers in an area the size of Europe, Western Europe. The river is the alternative means of transportation. So the river's tremendously important to the people of Congo. It's also tremendously important to the animals of Congo, I'm sorry, of, of Africa. If you look at Africa and you look at the way that animal life, not just fish life, but land animals too, the way they're distributed on, the, on, on that continent 
is determined very much by the Congo River. You'll find species that are found only to the north of the Congo River, species only found to the south, just to the east, just to the west. The Congo River has played an incredibly important role in dividing up the biology, the biological diversity of Africa. And I'll give you a very good example. Our closest relatives, the chimpanzees and the so-called pygmy chimpanzees, the bonobos, two species of chimpanzees, our closest living relatives. The chimpanzees will, are only found to the north of the Congo. The bonobos are only found to the south of the Congo. There's nowhere on earth, except a zoo, where you could find a chimpanzee and a bonobo living together. They're separated by the Congo River. Now, if you know a little bit about the behavior of chimpanzees and bonobos, you'll know they're very, very different kinds of animals, yet that we're, we're equally closely related to both of them. It would be kind of interesting to know. It's almost like the chimpanzees are, are make war, not love, and the bonobos are make love, not war. It would be very interesting to know, you know, was there ever a time that the chimpanzees and the bonobos were ever to found together? And probably the chimpanzees would have killed the bonobos, but, you know, let's put that aside. It's, that's another way of saying, has the Congo River always looked this way? Has the Congo River always been like that? And the answer is no. The Congo River has not always looked like this. And what you see on this um, graph is, oh, sorry, is the Congo River, um, I think I'm going to be too inept to use these slides, but you can see the main channel of the Congo River is the darkest bit on the slide. And it's, it's, it was described by Joseph Conrad in his Heart of Darkness as a great sinister snake with its body coiling through the heart of Africa and its head and its neck stuck into the Atlantic Ocean. I have been working in the Congo for, wow, since, I mean, it's about 10 years now. But I concentrate on a particular part of the Congo, and that's what I'm going to tell you about, and that's what I'm going to, whoops, that's what I'm going to, that's where I found this fish that I want to quickly um, tell you the story about. So, um, the Congo River is this big snake coiling through the heart of Africa, a la Joseph Conrad. The head and the neck. The head is in the Atlantic Ocean. I study the area which is basically the head and the neck of that great snake. It's the, it's the short stretch of the Congo River that, that flows from um, a strange geological structure called Stanley Pool, which is, or it's called Pool Malebo nowadays. It was called Stanley Pool because Stanley supposedly discovered it. Um, it's a, a swelling in the middle of the Congo River. Most of the Congo, all of those thousands of kilometers of that big, sleepy, African queen-like river of the Congo flow over a high plateau. The river reaches the, um, the, the um, edge of that plateau. It swells out into this big pool, and then it plunges over the lip of that plateau and plunges down to the Atlantic Ocean. So where it leaves the plateau and plunges down to the Atlantic Ocean, it's called the Lower Congo River, and that's where, where I work. It's actually very different from the African queenie, meandering, leeches, kind of foresty, jungly main Congo. It's, it's a, it's, it plunges down a gorge. It's, it's beautiful. It reminds me more of, I don't know, life in the Seychelles than, than, than the middle of the, the rainforest. It's a very different kind of river. It's also very different because there are an extraordinary number of fish there. And I haven't got time to, get to go into the whole story. Uh, people have mentioned the internet. I do encourage you, if any of you are interested to learn more about this and my research, you can get lots of links uh, on the internet to it. But I just want to talk just in, in broad generalities. And in broad generalities, what we've discovered in the Lower Congo River is literally um, an evolutionary paradise for fish. We found literally hundreds of species of fish living in this short stretch of river. The stretch of river I'm talking about is about 300 kilometers in length. Yet we found more species of fish in that short stretch of river than exist on the entire continent of Europe with all its rivers. So it's, something's going on there. And at first we thought, oh, well, what's going on? Um, well, because the river is plunging off the plateau, we have large numbers of rapids. So you have a stretch of still water, then some rapids, then stretch of still water, rapids, etc. And we thought with classic Darwinian idea that, well, species are being separated from one another 
by these rapids. So if you live in a rapid, um, that's where you hang out. You, and then you're separated from the next rapid by a stretch of still water. And if you live in still water, you're separated from the next stretch of still water by a rapid. So you're kind of divided up longitudinally. And maybe because you're stuck on your rapid or you're stuck in your still stretch of water, over evolutionary time, because you're not communicating with those things that are living on the other side of the rapid or in the next rapid, evolution is taking place and you're beginning to change. And if that happens over a long period of time, you become a new species. And so maybe this is, maybe it's the rapids that are causing this high rates of speciation in the lower Congo. And a lot of our research kind of indicated that yes, that's definitely happening. But something else was happening. Because when we look very closely, say we're on one side of the river, and maybe it's, it's on one of those calm stretches, so there's no rapids. And we sample fish from that side of the river. And then we go over to the other side of the river, which can be as near as like crossing the Hudson uh, you know, uh, here. It can be really quite narrow, or it can be very narrow. It can be less than a quarter of a kilometer across. We get fishes from the other side, and they look the same. So we think, oh, we've got the same species. We're just looking at populations from either side of the river. But when we look at their DNA, we realize that something very strange is happening. They're, they're separated from each other. It's, it, we, and we can do calculations based on um, population genetics. And we can calculate how many individuals are actually crossing from one side of the river to the other and interbreeding. And it turns out that in many places, it's remarkable. It's maybe one individual every three or four generations is actually going across the river. It's like, um, <coughs> you know, we, we, we only marry people in Manhattan. We don't, we don't marry people from Hoboken. It would be like that, you know? <laughs> So, so something very odd is happening. And the rapids don't account for that. So, so this was a conundrum. And as scientists, we were very interested in it, and our colleagues were very interested. But, but what was going on? And then we, we come to, our, to, to my little fish that we discovered. After uh, quite a, a long time working here, we, we came to a place, a very isolated place on the Lower Congo River, where we found this fish. Now, I know it doesn't look much to you, but this is a very interesting fish. It's completely blind, no eyes, and it's completely lacking in pigment. So, no eyes, no pigment. Very strange. The other thing that was strange about this fish is that it was dead. We have never found one of these fish alive. Now, we spoke to the local villagers who, who live in this small area where we find this strange, we came across this strange fish. And they said, oh yeah, we know that fish. Yeah, it's fine. We find it dead, you know, occasionally. Um, tastes okay. <laughs> um, so we were like, dead? What, what do you mean you find it dead? And they said, yeah, yeah, we, always, we find it dead. So we said, well, wh where's it come from? I don't know, we find it dead. Now that's a very, very strange thing for a biologist to come across a species that's only found dead. <laughs> so we were very puzzled by it. And you know, the fact that it has no eyes, the fact that it has no pigment, really um, makes you think, well, maybe this thing is living in a cave. Because a lot of cave animals, you know, in the absence of light, for all sorts of reasons, do not go to the expense of developing eyes and pigment. So maybe it's a cave fish. We searched the r everywhere for it. No caves, no fish anywhere other than dead by the river. As we puzzled and puzzled, the local people came and brought us one more individual. And that individual was just alive, was just, just alive. And I, unfortunately, it died as I held it in my hand. Um, but as it died, it revealed something very, very interesting. We saw that all along its back and all around its gills and under its skin were air bubbles. Embolism. It was degassing. So having that one almost dead specimen really then set a, a, a light bulb off. Could, could there be deep, deep water here? Could it be that actually these animals are dying of decompression syndrome? It's almost as if they're dying of, of the, the equivalent of the bends. Could they be living really deep and for some reason coming, being pulled up to the surface, 
degassing on the way out, dying, then no longer any trace of air bubbles because they've been dead for a while. Could that be what's happening? And it was, it was the discovery of this fish in this place that set us on this whole new trajectory, which was to look at the River Congo the way a fish looks at it. We realized we'd been making the mistake. We'd been looking at the river, how humans look at it, how terrestrial animals look at it. And you think, ah, it's a river. If there's water, a fish can swim in it. You know, it's land that's the great barrier for fishes. Now we had a new complication, depth. So we were able to go back to this site with um, colleagues from the US Geological Survey who brought some very sophisticated equipment which was very hard to deploy in, in Congo, believe me, but they, we did a great job. And we managed to get some tremendous data. So as we made transects back and forth to either sides of the river, we measured not only the depth and what the bottom looked like, we measured the, the, the velocity of the water as you're going up and down the, 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 um, the uh, water column, right? How a fish would see it. And the result was really completely unexpected. And I know I have a very difficult graphic there. But what I want you to first see is that we found incredible depths. In this particular place, we found that there, were, there was a canyon in the middle of the Congo River that was over 580 feet deep. 580 feet deep. That's phenomenal. That's unheard of. We also found, and in this graphic, um, I'm showing you it's from either side, from one bank to the other, and you're looking straight up and down the, the, the river channel, and it's color-coded. So red and yellow is water that's traveling extremely fast downstream. But then look at that blue. That blue is, traveling, is water traveling extremely fast in the opposite direction. So it's almost as if we've discovered not only tremendous depths, but we've found rivers within rivers, and they're, going, they're flowing in, on, in opposite directions. Now, you imagine if you're a small fish living on one side of the river, you know, that water becomes a barrier. That water isn't a means for you to disperse. That water is a barrier. So that one small fish and our, our, our search to understand it really revealed this whole new world. It told us so much more about the Congo River. And of course, now we can begin to use that information to really begin to try and unravel why, and I think explain why there are so many species in this one stretch of the river. So that's, that's, that's really cool. And it, it gives us, I think, another of these great model systems that we're always looking for in, in biology. It's a model system that we can really use to, to dissect and really begin to understand how speciation occurs. Why, why is it that there are so many different kinds of species on the planet? So with that, I'm going to say thank you and um, urge all of you and your kids and, and grandkids to become ichthyologists because <laughs> it really pays off. Thank you.